Hello and welcome. I'm really excited that you've committed to yourself to join me on this Wellbeing at Work workshop. And I know that time is precious, so I have the intention that I'm going to offer you real value over the next 40 to 45 minutes that we'll be spending together. So I'm going to share some stuff with you that will make a difference to all that you're creating. So let's have a look at what you're going to get um, in this workshop. We teach on a daily basis at Fresh Air Friday simple tools that work. We see people using them, taking them into their workplace, taking them at home. So we see them working on a daily basis. And not only are we going to give you these tools and ideas, I'm going to give you the confidence to use them because it's all very well knowing stuff in your head. It's something else to actually put it into place. And my intention today is to allow you to take away some stuff that you can start using later today or, or tomorrow at the latest. I don't know where you personally are on your well-being strategy. Perhaps you're well on your way and you're looking for tools to add to a, an already evolving program. Um, or perhaps you're in a situation where you haven't really started. You know that well-being at work is something that matters um, and you're not quite there. Wherever you are on that spectrum, the ideas we're going to share today that I'm going to share with you will support continued change or start the change that's happening. Just so that you know whether you're in the right place or not, I, I want to run through who this um, workshop's designed for. It's designed for leaders, it's designed for HR professionals, it's designed for managers, it's designed for business owners, and it's designed for people who work with people. If you fall into any of those categories, you know that your own well-being and the well-being of your staff is crucial to your business. Um, if we don't look after the well-being of our greatest asset and often our most expensive asset, it doesn't serve our organization or our business in any way. So if you fall into any of those categories, we've designed this workshop for you. So brief introduction to myself, just so that you know um, what I bring to the table, really. So I've been coaching now in business for the best part of 20 years and that started coaching people within their business to grow their business. Um, in 2010 our daughter developed anorexia and she refused to speak to any other health professionals and um, I felt faced with a decision. Um, it was vital for me to do something about her well-being and so I skilled up and I immersed myself in the tools that really it positively impacted mental and emotional well-being. It was a hugely difficult time for our daughter and our family as a whole. And what I discovered as I started reading and researching what was necessary to support her, that there were these really simple tools around that made a massive difference to all of us. And I'd had to work really hard to find that stuff. And this frustration grew in me that these tools weren't at my fingertips. And as I went on and developed my coaching, this seed grew and I realized that it was that I had a bit of a soapbox here and, and I was passionate about mental and emotional well-being. And I wanted to bring that to a wider audience. Um, and Fresh Air Friday was the result of that. We uh, with my business partner, we wanted to create something that looked after people's total well-being. Because whilst people have some idea about how to look after their physical well-being, far fewer people know how to look after their mental and emotional well-being. And we wanted something that provided a, a way to support that whole that whole area. So that's been my passion now for the last seven, nearly eight years. Um, and it's what I work on on a daily basis. So this is a well-being workshop. So what is well-being? And there are loads of definitions out there. There isn't a single definition out there. But at Fresh Air Fridays, what we refer to as well-being is actually as simple as being well. So feeling good about yourself, your life, how you're spending the time, the quality of your relationships, 
how you deal with challenge and potential upset. And that whole aspect of being well impacts every part of your life. Now, for us, we believe that covers four areas. So we've talked a little bit about physical. That, that's often where people start with well-being. But for us, it also encompasses our emotional and mental well-being and also our spiritual well-being. And, and by spiritual, we don't we don't mean um, affiliated to any religion, but we mean being part of something bigger. So so a feeling of connection, which is vital to well-being. So for us, well-being takes up those four aspects. And you can see the way we've drawn it in this that diagram. If you work on your physical well-being, that also impacts or potentially impacts your spiritual, emotional, and mental well-being. If you work on any one of those aspects, it does impact the others. And when we work on them as a whole, we get we have people being truly well. And that's our intention in all the work that we do. So what challenge are we facing in the workplace? Uh, in life, actually, life and work these days are far, are, are really fast paced. And you know that you know that change is faster today than it has been in the history of mankind. And that is causing stress and anxiety on an unprecedented level across across all sectors of society. We have huge demands on our times. So we never switch off. Um, we, we go to work. We organize the children. We do this. We do that. There's pressure on us all the time. And that's exhausting. It's stressful for people. And even if you've got things handled, even if life feels fairly balanced and you're you're doing well at this moment in time, life comes along or or should I say death comes along. We're so used to being able to control things in our lives, to to feel like we, we're on it. Um, actually, when stuff happens that is out of our control, when when we have some trauma or some disaster in our life, when somebody close to us dies, it's tough. And, and we're much less used to these days having uncontrollable things in our lives. And people take that hard often. I, as I talk to um, senior managers, business owners, um, HR professionals, one of the things that I see happening regularly is that they do provide great services, great outsource services. Maybe that there's a counsellor that staff at work can access. But often staff won't use these things because there's a stigma attached to not being able to perform well at work. So mentally and emotionally, there can be a problem um, because people because of the stigma attached to it. And we one of the things we aim to do in the work we do is break down that stigma. And I'm hopefully going to share some ideas that will help people approach you and discuss things with you more readily. Mental ill health is at an all time high. We've never seen levels like this before. Um, one in four people these days is suffering some kind of ill health. Um, and and it's tough. Talk about keeping it real. I thought I had prevented any distractions and the cat came in needing feeding and I didn't want you having mewing in the background for the next um, half an hour. So as I was saying, one in four people these days is suffering some kind of mental ill health. We kind of expect people to get colds. Um, we much less expect people to have some kind of stress, depression, anxiety going on. But it's happening. And whether or not the people around you are sharing that, there are certainly people within your circle um, who are having problems, whether or not they're. So and the other, th yeah, the, the other problem that I come across when I speak to people is um, there's a lack of knowledge. So I've talked to, to senior people in an organization or HR people who who've said, you know, I could see somebody struggling, but I don't want to talk to them because I'm I'm actually scared of opening up this can of worms that I don't know what to do with. Um, so there's this fear when people are suffering depression, potentially, if you talk to people, you might end up with something that you can't deal with. 
um, that is rarely the case uh, and often people just need to be heard and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the workshop. So these are the challenges we're facing in the workforce today. And what does this mean for our business? Um, I don't much like the word presenteeism, but it fits nicely on a slide. And, and what we mean by presenteeism is people being in work, so they're at the desk, but actually their heads, their brain's not with them, or they're, they're sitting there worrying about stuff going on at work uh, or at home. Uh, and that's an, that's an interesting thing, actually. A lot, of the, a lot of the challenges that people have aren't necessarily created in the workplace, but people can't help but bring the stuff that's going on at home with them. So often we see people at their desks, but not really there. When people are depressed, anxious, stressed, it leads to low staff morale. And low staff morale with one or two people can be, can be catching. And if people are stressed, depressed, anxious, unwell, physically unwell as well, you get poor engagement they're not they're not happy in their work they're not able to deliver their work to the best of their ability their ability and long-term absence it can be a big issue for organizations if people aren't well whether that's physically or emotionally um they're liable to go on the sick they're liable to not be in work and that's expensive and particularly um, with stress related illnesses it's really difficult to know when you will get people back at work if somebody breaks a leg you kind of have some idea about when they'll be back at their desk if if it's depression or anxiety it, it's really hard to know when they'll be back with you so there are some solutions out there that there are good things happening um, there are numerous healthy eating campaigns so um, indicating the kinds of foods that that serve us um, for our well-being. There are physical challenges out there. There's a pedometer challenge. There are the three peaks challenges, the cycling challenges, walking challenges, great team building activities that can get people out moving um, and making a difference to their physical well-being. And increasingly, there are people offering mindfulness sessions, both in work and out of work. Um, and mindfulness is is part. We we do mindfulness in the in the programs that we run. We 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 touch on mindfulness as a way to be really helpful, useful um, ideas and solutions that are already out there, out there. But why don't things always work? Well, there are a few reasons. Um, I don't know about you, but when somebody tells me what to do, uh, I don't much like it, and and telling people you must do this, you should lose weight, you need to move, uh, you, ne <laughs> you need to relax. That's uh, it, uh, when you say relax, it doesn't really ra relax people. I'm really, really pleased to see that more and more we're getting a coaching culture, which means being open to people finding their own solutions. So find allowing people to explore how they find their own solutions. So many of the things out there are telling people what to do and telling doesn't work, doesn't work effectively for very many people. And if we can move to a coaching environment in work, it will be much more, um, much more effective. So sometimes with the challenges, you know, with the fitness challenges, we're often talking to the converted. So we're talking to people who are already exercising, already doing stuff. So not necessarily making a difference. And, and that's also true. Um, often the mindfulness programs appeal to people who are already in that frame of mind. And the other key thing is with some of these interventions, they don't build habits. So you need things to happen regularly in order for them to make a difference. An awareness day um, might be a good information finder for people. But what we see is Often people need somebody to hold them, hold their hand to keep it going. Just throwing information at people doesn't necessarily work. So a well-being at work week, great information gatherer, but not necessarily creating a habit that people will stick at. Um, so these are some of the reasons that, that some of the solutions out there aren't being really effective. So now a moment for you. One of the tools that we teach on Fresher Fridays is um, is a breathing technique. Um, 
And now I know you've been breathing since you were born because you're listening to me now. So that's helpful. But what people don't always realize is that our tool, our breath is this amazing tool that we carry with us at all times. We can't forget it, um, which is fantastic. And there are loads of breathing techniques and awareness of breath is really, really helpful um, for our well-being. Now, we teach a, a really simple breathing technique on all our sessions, and that is 7-Eleven breathing. Now, when I was a kid, um, we had a 7-Eleven shop, and the 7-Eleven shop was always open, just as our 7-Eleven breath is always available to us. So 7-Eleven breathing simply means breathing in for a count of seven and out for a count of 11. Now, if you've never done any deep breathing in your life, that might seem huge um, to breathe in for seven and out for 11. What's important is that the out breath is significantly longer than the in breath. So the count doesn't really matter. So if 7 is too much, you might do three, five or five, eight. The rate at which you count doesn't matter. As I say, it's that out breath being significantly longer than the in breath. Now, to do that, it might, for some people, it's really helpful to put their hand on their belly because you really need to fill your lungs, feel your belly expanding, and then really let go in a long, slow out breath. Now, if you're in a room full of other people, uh, they don't need to see you doing this. So you can do this without anybody noticing. Um, so we're just going to try that. We're going to try it for two or three breaths. And this is just an exploration for you, just to see how this works for you. So if you're sitting, I would invite you to put your feet firmly on the ground, just so you feel comfortable and supported. And perhaps just bring your shoulders up a bit so your, your spine's nice and straight. And then if it feels comfortable, putting your hand on your belly and taking a really deep breath in. I'm not going to count for you. You just do it in your own time and then a really long, slow breath out. And then just explore that for two or three more rounds. Really deep breath in, long, slow breath out in your own time. just finishing off the cycle you're on so how does that feel just take a moment check out how you feel what happens with that long slow out breath is that we click in our parasympathetic nervous system so the opposite to fight or flight when we when we need to react to something our heart rate raises and we get sweaty palms and we get into action but being in action all the time isn't helpful for us. It's really stressful over a long period of time. And using that long out breath calms everything down. Our bodies know that already. If you've been really busy and you can at last sit down, typically we go. <sighs> so our bodies already know that a long sigh out is really helpful. But we can use that knowledge. And I really recommend that people use that kind of breath regularly um, throughout their working day. So I use it when I break, wake up in the morning. I do a couple of minutes of 7-Eleven breathing. I use it when I go to bed, just before I go to sleep, I lie in bed, do some 7-Eleven breathing. You might use it when you transition from work to home. So when you arrive on your driveway, you might sit in the car just for a moment, 7-Eleven breath to move yourself from your work life into your home life. If a customer or, or a member of staff just come up to you and they've pressed all your buttons and you can feel you're about to react, that 7-Eleven breath will calm you down and have you and, and allow you to think. When we're highly emotional, when we're highly stressed, we cannot think. We, we're not in our thinking brain. So calming everything down allows us some thinking space. So really, really useful tool. And if you take nothing else away from this workshop today, please practice that breath. Um, explore it for you. 
see what happens. OK, so let's talk about some potential solutions. And that 7-Eleven breath is a solution and certainly um, something I would invite you to explore. Breathing techniques are really great to explore. And there's lots out there, but that's a really great starting point. And actually all you need. Um, but obviously, if you're interested, take a look at some other stuff. So the solution we always start with is that we have to lead by example. Um, that kind of sucks a bit, doesn't it? And I know that you can probably tell me the people in your organization, um, maybe above you, maybe below you, who who really need some well-being support. And it's really easy, easy for all of us to point the finger and say, I'm OK, Jack, but actually it's them. The truth is, if we don't get it right for us, it's not going to we're not going to be able to impact the people around us. And we talk about when we when we work with people, we invite people to explore what looking after themselves actually means. Um, and when we start putting in practices that serve us, it starts trickling throughout the organization. We talk about the activities we did at the weekend. People see that we're feeling better if we've got our work day organized. So actually we can take a lunch break um, that that we do some walking, that we that we are attending our exercise class or they see what we're eating if they see we're looking after ourselves and we're we're well and happy then that encourages other people to we, we've talked about there's no point telling people people pay much more attention to what we do um, than what we say and there are some insidious things we do you know particularly if it's your business or you're really senior in the business you have got too much to do. Your in tray is going to be full when you die. I know the list is too long. If you don't take any breaks, it, it will be really difficult for your staff to take any breaks. And if you're not taking breaks, none of you are working effectively. You need that space in order to work effectively. So you need to lead by example. Some of your most creative stuff will come when you're relaxing. Um, you need to find time for the things that make you happy. Another real biggie. So we've talked about breathing. We've talked about our own self-care practices. For me, just going back on the self-care practices, if I don't walk every day, um, I become grouchy and that impacts everybody around me. The next biggie is creating a culture of listening. As a society, generally, we don't listen. So if you imagine a conversation, perhaps with a friend over a glass of wine, you ask them a question and they start responding. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah, it was like that for me. And even if you don't say it out loud in your head, you're you're waiting for the person to pause in order to give them your version. Or you have somebody coming to you with some problems and other people's problems are so easy in comparison to your own, aren't they? And and you've got solutions for them and they're telling you their problems and you're just desperate to burst in there and tell them what they need to do. So most of the time we're not listening. When somebody comes to you and they want to talk, the best thing you can do is nothing. And by nothing, I actually mean give them a bit of attention, but keep your mouth closed. They don't need to hear you say anything. You can nod. You can listen to them with every fiber of your body, but you don't need to say anything. In meetings, and um, it's really helpful to use a structure where you've got times that people want to share together. Um, structured time so everybody is heard, even if they think they've got nothing to say, giving people some structured time to say their piece is really helpful. And I've at the bottom of this slide here, there's a great book. Um, by Nancy Klein called Time to Think. And she talks about how you can create a um, thinking structure in your business. It's incredible for staff well-being, for creativity, for problem solving. Um, when you get deep into this stuff, it makes a difference. So we're talking about well-being to get people present and working at their desks. But when you start putting in good well-being practices, it doesn't it doesn't just stop with the person. It makes your whole organization better. 
and that's a book I'd really, really recommend um, in terms of listening. Um, and and if you want to talk more with me at a later date, there's lots of good stuff out there um, that can help you. The next thing is to save your opinion. You know, somebody's come to you with a problem and um, they're sharing with you and you've got an opinion. I'm, I'm very opinionated. I love sharing my opinion. But actually, when people come to you to talk, don't give them their, your opinion there and then or or don't give don't give your opinion until they ask for it. They may not ask for it. You don't you often don't need to say anything. People often just need to be heard. It's powerful. Um, until you've tried it, it's it's really difficult to appreciate how powerful it is. You often don't have to say anything, and you mostly don't need to give your opinion. I'm not saying you shouldn't go away and and have a considered response, but when somebody's talking to you, just let them talk. And when somebody's spoken to you, show appreciation. So even if they've just told you a load of stuff that you don't agree with and um, it's a, it's offensive or, or it, it's pressed your buttons, you don't like it, you want to do something with it, wh whichever way it goes, show some appreciation. So thank you, Philip. I really appreciate your coming to share that with me and, and feeling able to give me that information. That's enough for the moment. Or you might want to say, I'll have a think about that and come back to you at a later date. But appreciate the fact that they've come to you or appreciate if they've given you some information. I, I really appreciate that you've done that thing, whatever it is. But show some appreciation for the conversation or something specific within that within the conversation so you don't need to give them advice opinion but show some appreciation whatever you think of it be grateful that they've shared it with you and when you when people start being heard they feel entirely different they will feel safe and supported within the organization by you if you can hear them The next key thing, um, the next key tool to take away really is um, appreciation and gratitude. And I, I sometimes come across people who think, oh, it's a bit woolly, it's a bit fluffy. You know, people know what they've got to do. They don't need to be told thank you all the time. I was reading an article only the mo this morning that was talking about a Gallup poll that that showed that people leave work leave jobs more often because they don't feel appreciated than because they're not paid enough. So appreciation and gratitude are vital for keeping staff in your work, in, in your business. Um, <clears throat> appreciation and gratitude are vital um, for the way our brain works. We're actually programmed to see problems. We're we're programmed to see the negative stuff over our evolution that's kept us safe it's been advantageous to keep us alive however that's what people tend to focus on and um, our brains filtering all the time through all this information we're bombarded with and we've been programmed to notice the negative for some people that can take them into a downward spiral when we start noticing things that we're grateful for we nudge the spiral in the opposite direction. So when we notice, oh, that was a really cup, nice cup of tea, or I really enjoyed just chatting to Sue at lunchtime. Um, it was great to get that piece of work done. When I start to notice those things, when I start to appreciate things, I get on an upward spiral. I start to notice that things are working, not not working. So rather than, oh, it's hard, it's stressful, I'm starting to notice the things that are going well. The size of the things we appreciate isn't important. So little things are, are just as we don't, it doesn't have to be about winning loads of money or something amazing happens. Just that regular appreciation will bring more things for us to notice. Making it a daily habit. So having some kind of structure that you, um, one end or other of the day, or maybe at lunchtime, Make it a habit to just notice what's gone really well this morning. Um, 
when you have a team meeting, start to make it cultural. So when you have a team meeting, uh, get everybody to, to start with what's going well before you plan to the problems and perhaps the things that you want to, to look at and improve. Get people talking about the stuff that's going well in their work. Make it cultural. So, so make it a habit that people regularly show gratitude for things that people are doing well, that you're regularly, all of you, noticing um, the good stuff in life. It will lift the mood for everybody. It will get the whole organisation on an upward spiral. And far from being fluffy and soft, it creates so much more positivity in the workplace. And it's not about pretending tough stuff isn't happening, but it's noticing the good stuff that is happening, even when life is tough. And actually, one of the things we invite people to do is to practice their gratitude when life is good, because it's going to rain at some point. It is going to rain in your life. And if, you, if you've got the tool of being able to notice the good stuff, even when it's raining in your life, um, that's absolutely huge. And be specific. So um, rather than saying, I'm really grateful for a nice day, be really specific about the elements in the day that you were grateful for. And when you're giving praise to people, be really specific about, um, Sue, I really appreciated how thorough you were in that. I could see that the research you did of that particular article made a difference to, um, to how it read. So being specific about um, what it is you're appreciating. So our fourth strategy for today, and, and there are loads, I'm only going to cover five with you today. Um, but the fourth strategy is incidental movement. So we've talked about people doing physical activities, but actually we can put incidental movement into the working day. Walking meetings are amazing. And whenever we work with an organization, one of the, the key things we want to leave behind is, is a habit of walking meetings. Now, if there are two or three of you involved in a meeting and you don't need a laptop, and um, I suspect many people use the laptop as a bit of a crutch, um, or people say, I need to write notes. Actually, when you're walking together, particularly if you're walking outside, um, you'll remember that when we were by the tree, we were talking about that situation with Dan or or when we were down um, when we were down by the building. That was when I was thinking when we were discussing um, that other subject. So you will remember the stuff. So if you need, you can take notes when you get back. But there are so many advantages to a walking meeting. When you're walking with somebody, you can't help but fall into the same movement without without intending it. Your strides will fall in with one another. In coaching terms, we call that rapport. And when you're in rapport with somebody, conversation flows much more readily than when you're not. If you if you're talking about a challenge or a problem, if you're sitting opposite somebody, maybe across a desk, you've got the challenge between you as you walk you've got the challenge in front of you, you're facing it together. And that makes a really big difference. Another advantage of walking is that you have both sides of your brain engaged. With the left-right movement, you've, you have to be working in both sides of your brain, and that makes you much more creative, much more solution orientated. So the power of walking is amazing, and I'd invite you to do it um, whenever you can. And, um, and Actually, don't let the weather put you off. It's a it's a big question. I don't want to go into it lots today, but it's a big question. People say all our all our work is done outside, um, and people say, what about the weather? Well, it's fascinating that as people start to be okay with walking when it's raining or windy or a little bit cold, they start to get okay with that, and actually, it starts to make them more resilient to whatever is going on in life, work, whatever. Your work layout's really key as well. So I think there was a time when we were all organized and we, we had our filing cabinet by our desk and the bin was there so we didn't have to move and the printer was close by. Um, the research is now saying that sitting is the new smoking. Sitting for eight hours a day is having a massive detrimental effect on our well-being. Uh, we need to move. 
Um, even if you're a runner, to sit at your desk for eight hours and then move, at, go for a 10K run at the end of the day, that's not great for you either. Moving regularly within the working day is really, really, really important. There are systems in your body um, that aren't pumped. So you need movement to get to get things moving around your body. So have your work area so that you have to walk to the printer. You have to get up to put stuff in in the bin. Um, you can't get to the filing cabinet without standing up. I have my phone at the other side of the room so that when the phone rings, I have to get up and answer the phone. Put as much incidental movement into your work layout as you possibly can. You know, I, I, I hear about tea runs and um, it's great to be friendly and I'm not saying don't support one another and do stuff, but actually it's quite helpful for you to have to get up and get your own cup of tea. Um, so make the work layout that people have to get up. Change the venue. Don't have a meeting at your desk. Just walk down to the canteen. So um, so you've got to go somewhere different. So that change of venue, wherever you are, try and put a bit of movement to wherever you're meeting people and get away from your desk. Um, people who work through lunch hours uh, frustrate me. Uh, and I understand my in trays just as full my workload is just as heavy. Um, there is too much to do. I understand that. We're building a business. I understand the trials and tribulations of that. But you need to take a break for your mental and physical well-being to be well. And, you know, what's the point of working now uh, nine hours a day without any shifting? Uh, what's the point? You, you might make more money, but you might not be well enough to appreciate it so take your lunch breaks they make you cre creative put some time away from your desk in sorry that was a bit telly wasn't it but I get a bit passionate about it's so easy to put in incidental movement it's also it's also quite easy to forget to do it and, and making it a habit makes a real difference um fresher Fridays it's in the name really isn't it we do all our work outside. We take people outside into green spaces. There is so much research now that says we've evolved in nature. We're designed to be outside. And for many people, they spend their lives in boxes. They go from a box in a metal box to a concrete box, back into a metal box. If you're really lucky, you go home to a stone box rather than a concrete box. But we're in boxes all the time, watching boxes. Um, and we're designed to be in nature. There's a great article on Radio 4 yesterday from a psychiatrist at Exeter University talking about um, how important it is in mental health recovery to be in green spaces. We need it. You feel better. When I move a group of people from the foyer of an office and I stand them under a tree, their body language changes. It's vital. And there are things you can do to bring it into your working day. So I've talked about how it's vital for well-being. Wherever possible, get out there. We've we've talked about that. If depending on your place of work, you know, if you can create green spaces outside, that's great. If you can put a picnic bench for people to have their lunch, um, take your meeting down at the local park. Walk down just through a road where there's ni nice gardens. So get out of the office wherever possible. Get nature into the office. So screensavers make a difference. You know, encourage people to have or, or have your work screensaver, have, have the standard work screensaver as something green. So it's got it's got nature on the screensaver. Make sure the work, the artwork on the walls are expansive scenes of mountains or beautiful pictures of trees or, or animals or get some gentle images in the background it relaxes people to have them there I was in an office recently and um, the owner was really into rugby which is absolutely great but all there was on the walls was bright red um, rugby shirts really intense not relaxing f for the staff and the people in that space at all so pictures of nature on the wall on your computers, absolutely great. 
And the other thing is get pot plants in, get trees in. Um, they make a difference. Having a bit of nature in the office makes a massive difference. Has your staff feeling better? It's a really low cost solution. I know somebody needs to water them. You could use cactuses. They need less attention. And there are organize out, organizations out there. If, if it's a real issue for you to look after the plants, there are people who will come in and water and polish your plants. But your staff, your clients, anybody coming into your working space, they will feel better if you have those things in in the surroundings. So we've covered loads today. Um, simple things make a massive difference. That breathing technique that we started with, massive difference to how people feel. Don't underestimate simple. Simple is really powerful. So if somebody's come along with some solutions and they seem too simple, if it were me, I'd grasp them with both hands. Nudge people. Make it as easy, make it easier for people to do than not to do. So don't have vending machines with rubbish in them. Don't have vending machines with Coke and, and chocolate and crisps in there. Have a bowl of fruit available. Have things that serve people nutritionally in the place. Make it a habit that meet once a week to go out for a walk or or make it encourage people to go out together to have a walk at lunchtime. Make it a thing that you all meet at a certain time to get out there. So nudge people in the right directions. Start rearranging your office to encourage other people to rearrange their office. And take action. I've shared some really, really empowering tools here today. So they may look really simple, but but just taking one or two of the things I've shared here and, and implementing them will make a difference. So don't just think, oh, that's nice. Take some action about it. So it's simple, not easy. And when I when I was working with my daughter, the stuff we were doing was simple. It was really, really hard to do. So so bear in mind that simple doesn't mean it mean easy. But if you commit, if you commit and you're consistent tiny little things over time will make a difference and don't go it alone you know don't try to change the whole of your workplace on your own get other people on board to help you to support you to make a difference let me just remind you very quickly what we've talked about there is a challenge we're all facing a challenge it's an ongoing challenge um, not all solutions are equal but hopefully I've given you some ideas about how to make things work a bit better. Lead by example. It has to start with you. Listen, 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 listen. Gratitude and appreciation, absolutely massive. Will starts to change everything. Put in movement regularly. A one off once a week isn't enough. It has to be regular movement and bring nature into your workplace it will make a difference so what's your potential future look like well well-being is cultural it starts with you but you can impact it it can start coming down from the top to make a difference working people towards through a coaching environment getting people to take personal responsibility will be massive it will change things in the workforce and if you do, if you implement some of the tools that I've talked about here, we envisage that people start, what we see with the people we work with is, is staff, managers, senior managers start responding rather than reacting. And being supported, you know, get support, work together. That feeling of support works at every level throughout the organisation. So I trust you've had some real value and you're taking some stuff away with you today. Just let me very briefly um, explain to you what Fresh Air Fridays do. I've told you that we provide, I've told you that we do all our work outside. Um, so we provide programs where we take individuals and staff outside and teams outside. We work with them in a coaching environment to allow them to create solutions for their total well-being. And some of the, all of the skills that we talked about today will form a part of the programs that we run. We train in-house trainers, so if you're ready to really take this on, 
um, then we can come in and um, train people within your organizations to provide the programs that we provide. And we provide learning materials to support all we do. So it's been great sharing this stuff with you. I'm passionate about well-being. I want people to be as well as they can because that's how they lead their best life. When we're well, we make a difference in the world. If we're not well, we're not fit to make that difference. And I truly want you and your organization to be making a difference. So thank you so much for your time. I would love to have a conversation with you. I'd love to support you um, to explore how you can really create well-being in, in your workplace. Myself or one of our team can talk to you. Um, so please do get in touch. You've got my email address here. You've got the web address. So um, do hook up with us. It's been great to share time with you. Have a brilliant day. Thank you so much for your time.